This is not a test. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. An unintended side effect of the COVID-19 outbreak in China is, smaller carbon, is a smaller carbon footprint. The country has cut its carbon dioxide emissions by about 100 million metric tons over the past two weeks. That's nearly the same amount that Chile emits in one year. Well, according to a report by non-profit group Carbon Brief, travel and transport restrictions and less economic activity have translated into a temporary dip in emissions. The decline is mainly due to the lower levels of coal burning for steel production and lower output of oil refineries. So talk about this connection between climate crisis and the coronavirus. We're not hearing very much about this. Well, we know in a general sense that climate, the climate crisis is resulting in tens of thousands of wild species moving into new places. It's scrambling our migration patterns. Um, and so that's going to contribute to this broader phenomenon of people and wildlife coming into new kinds of contact. Um, we can see with, for example, deforestation, that when you cut down the trees where bats roost, for example, they don't just go away. They come and roost in your back gardens and your farms and your yards instead. And that allows people and bats to come into new kinds of contact. And the microbes that live in their bodies, which don't cause them any kind of disease, can spill over into human bodies, and that's how we turn animal microbes into these epidemic and pandemic-causing pathogens. Now, this all comes as Beijing takes even more extreme measures to try to contain the virus. The central bank has devised a plan to deep clean China's cash. So the way this works is that cash is going to be sanitized with UV light. And then for seven days, it'll be quarantined for most of the parts of China. But in the epicenter, the quarantine will be for 14 days. And then um, money that is in hospitals or comes from the market or for public transportation at the epicenter is going to be destroyed. And by that, I mean, uh, state media say that the uh, money will be shredded and then it's going to be packed into bricks and then sent to the local power plant where it's going to be incinerated and then uh, created, uh, turned into energy. Keeping people locked down in their houses or in giant stadiums, quarantining entire cities as they are planning is not going to help anyone pay their bills. So just what is the eventual outcome? Economic chaos. Supermarket shelves are being stripped bare across Australia and New Zealand as shoppers stock up on essentials amid rising coronavirus fears. Empty store shelves, medical supply shortages, and a declining stock market. Doug, there's not even one documented case of coronavirus here in North Texas. Still, the fear of what it could do, not only as a health scare, but also its effect on the economy, has some North Texans taking drastic measures. The Bible tells us of a coming crisis that will make it impossible for some of God's people to buy or sell. It says in Revelation 13, 16, and 17, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I've attached a very clear Bible study on the mark of the beast under the video that leaves no doubt as to who the beast is and what his mark is. Please be sure to read and understand it. But briefly, I will explain. We are told in Daniel 7.23 that beasts are kingdoms. And there is a dragon beast that gives this amalgamated beast his power, seat, and authority. In Revelation 12, the dragon tried to devour a baby as soon as he was born, the Christ. That dragon beast symbolized the pagan Roman Empire trying to destroy the Christ through King Herod. Revelation 12.9 tells us the dragon is Satan, but Satan has worked through many kings in history. In Matthew 2, it is said that he was wroth and went to destroy all the children in Bethlehem. This is very similar to the dragon spirit being wroth and trying to destroy the seed of the woman in Revelation 12. It's about to come to pass again. That dragon gives its power to another beast or kingdom. And we have references to several beasts amalgamated into this one beast. It has the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Four beasts, which are all mentioned in Daniel 7, diverged into one. This amalgamation beast is none other than the Roman papacy. We read of this in history. Quote, Whatever Roman elements the barbarians and Arians left came under the protection of the Bishop of Rome, who was the chief person there after the emperor's disappearance. The Roman Church in this way privily pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. 
The dragon gave the beast his power. In other words, pagan Rome gave papal Rome its power. The Bible tells us of this beast having a mark. I won't go over who the beast is extensively here, as I've left this study below for those Bereans who will see if these things are truly so. Some things are fulfilling before our eyes. Not because everyone is dying or about to die from coronavirus. In fact, up to 650,000 people get the flu each year, and up to 50,000 people die of the flu each year. At the time of this video, in three months, coronavirus has 94,000 cases and only 3,200 deaths. Not very many in comparison to the flu. On the greatest day so far for the deaths on February 10th, they say coronavirus took the lives of 108 people. Scary, right? Well, on the same day, cancer took the lives of 26,283 people. Heart disease took the lives of 24,641 people. I could go on, but obviously when these numbers of coronavirus are put in perspective, it's easy to see that there are other issues far more threatening. The mainstream media is being used as a tool right now to get people to fulfill an agenda right now using fear tactics. But because the people have no understanding of these things, but that which they are being fed by the mainstream media, they're living in fear and panicking, which is causing them to make rash decisions. We talked about this in the last video on the coronavirus, about their fear, lies, and their manipulation. In this video, we're going to talk about how this is leading many to fulfilling much of Bible prophecy. This beast, which is the papacy and the prophecy, has a mark, and we may be about to see it enforced. If we look carefully, we can see how this is about to come to pass. Notice. For more, we're joined from Cleveland, Ohio, by Sonia Shah, science investigative journalist and the author of Pandemic, Tracking Contagion from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond. Her new book is titled The Next Great Migration, The Beauty and Terror of Life on the Move. Her latest article, published in The Nation, Think Exotic Animals Are to Blame for the Coronavirus? Think Again. Explain, Sonia Shah, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so what, what I was trying to get at in that article was this fact that over the past 50 years, we've had over 300 new pathogens either kind of newly emerge in, and uh, or, that never have been seen before or come into new places where they've never been before. Um, this novel coronavirus is just one of a whole spate of other pathogens we've seen, Ebola in West Africa, where it had never been seen before, Zika in the Americas, um, where it had never been seen before, new kinds of tick-borne diseases, new kinds of mosquito-borne diseases, new kinds of highly drug-resistant bacterial pathogens. Um, and we know that about 60 percent of these new pathogens originate in the bodies of animals. Um, about 70 percent of those are in wild animals. Um, but it's not because wild animals are particularly infested. It's because of the way humans and wildlife are coming into novel, intimate contact, and that is because of human activities. So talk about this connection between climate crisis and the coronavirus. We're not hearing very much about this. Well, we know in a general sense that climate, the climate crisis is resulting in tens of thousands of wild species moving into new places. It's scrambling our migration patterns. Um, and so that's going to contribute to this broader phenomenon of people and wildlife coming into new kinds of contact. Um, we can see with, for example, deforestation, that when you cut down the trees where bats roost, for example, they don't just go away. They come and roost in your back gardens and your farms and your yards instead. And that allows people and bats to come into new kinds of contact. And the microbes that live in their bodies, which don't cause them any kind of disease, can spill over into human bodies, and that's how we turn animal microbes into these epidemic and pandemic-causing pathogens. So the climate crisis is scrambling the migration patterns of the bats and other animals, fires, floods, moving them into cities, they say, and this is causing more people to get these diseases. So how are they saying we should deal with this? Well, we have to solve the climate crisis, and just how can we solve the climate crisis? Notice the following article concerning their green Sabbaths, quote, Scientists have begun to recognize the wisdom behind a technological Sabbath. When cities like Israel shut down for the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, nitrogen oxide pollution plummets. That one day of rest makes a difference. Scientists have determined that a day of rest would reduce carbon emissions dramatically without any additional spending, new technologies, or environmental consequences. It says a weekly Earth Day could be what saves us all. A day of rest is good for the environment. It is also good for the people. So wow, they are telling us that the day of rest could save us and the environment. 
You see, it's interesting that some are saying that the pollution and emissions over in Wuhan over the last couple months has reduced the emissions by the amount of emissions that New York City produces in a year. So what are we looking at to help us? Well, a day off every week would certainly reduce emissions worldwide. A green Sabbath we are being told. And of course the Pope would agree wholeheartedly with this. Pope Francis' environmental encyclical apparently documents how we can save the climate and save ourselves from a climate Armageddon. We quote him and he says, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God and ourselves and with others and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation. Laudato Si, page 237. Sunday is like the Jewish Sabbath, the Pope says. Well, that implies at least that Sunday is not the Sabbath. At least he's telling us that much. He's telling us it's the first day of the week. The Bible says the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. So when is the Sabbath? Well, it's documented that just as Daniel 7.25 says, he thinks to change times and laws. In their own words, they tell us this change is their mark of authority. Quoting from them, the attendance at Sunday Mass is the mark of a practical Catholic, and worship of God demands the attendance of Sunday Mass of every Catholic worthy of the name. Another quote says, distinctive of the Roman Catholic Church, Sunday Mass observance became a mark of a practicing Catholic. Another quote, it says, Sunday is our mark of authority. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And finally, clearing it up for us, they tell us when the real Sabbath is. Quoting, it says, Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. A mark, the mark of the beast. See, she thinks she can change God's own law. It's very clear that they want their mark to be placed on society, and this is taken from a non-religious site. They are saying the same thing as well. Listen to what they say, quote, Hitting the climate change targets agreed in Paris is estimated to cost $16.5 trillion, but there's hardly any cost to keeping green Sabbath days to cut carbon emissions. It's a solution that will have a profound impact on climate change for little to no capital investment. Once a week can result in over 15% annual emission reduction per country. Participation by only top carbon dioxide emitting countries will have the largest impact in climate change. Taken from greensabbath.org. Wow, 15% reduction in emissions. That's a really a big deal. It's on the way in the United States as well, veiled under legislation such as the New Green Deal, which is also associated with the Sunrise Movement. It may well be the Sunday Movement. They are striking on Fridays from school and the movement Fridays for the Future had reached a level of over 4 million people per week for the worldwide climate strike later last year when Greta Thunberg came to America. But we read of how the unions are getting on board in this article from The Guardian. Quote, Trade unions representing hundreds of millions of people around the world have come out in support of what is expected to be the biggest climate mobilization the world has ever seen. So what will the labor unions demand? Sundays for the future maybe? And speaking of giant labor unions, according to the International Labor Organization, which is a collaboration of UN officials and EU officials, as well as the bishops in the EU, they have written in a document entitled The Future of Work that the goal is, quote, reintegrate Sunday protection into EU law. So we're going from a movement of 4 million to hundreds of millions from Fridays for Future to Sundays for Future because the climate crisis is causing the animals to move into the cities and this is causing people to get disease such as the coronavirus and it's part of the idea to bring in a new world economy. And I have been enormously impressed by Pope Francis speaking out and his visionary views about creating a moral economy, an economy that works for all people, not just the people on top. And what he has said over and over again, we cannot allow the market just to do what the market does. That's not acceptable. We have got to ingrain moral principles into our economy. And there is no area where that is clearer than in the area of climate change. And now they are keeping everyone locked down in Wuhan, a city of over 11 million people and possibly the greatest trade center or buying and selling center in the world. It could not have been scripted any better. But now they are telling us the banknotes will cause us to get coronavirus if they keep sending them out. 
And then um, money that is in hospitals or comes from the market or for public transportation at the epicenter is going to be destroyed. And by that, I mean uh, state media say that the uh, money will be shredded and then it's going to be packed into bricks and then sent to the local power plant where it's going to be incinerated and then uh, created, uh, turned into energy. So what are they trying to get to with this one? What does this imply? Well, last week we watched some of the biggest stock market drops in history. When the economy crashes, there are no banknotes. We may have to go cashless. And who's going to control the money? I hope you get it. I've documented in previous videos how this is the goal. Please see the Sunday Law and the Pipeline series as well as the Out of the City series, which I will link to below the video. And so now with total control over the money, those who don't get their vaccines will not be able to buy or sell because they are not going along with the climate agenda. And what are these vaccines gonna inoculate you with? Well, go do your research, look up the ingredients. And the Pope is now telling us that those who reject climate change are perverse and basically enemies of the common good and righteousness. You see, the script is already written. Some of the elite believe they are writing the script, but God is going to bring their plans to nothing very soon. They want to rule as kings, and the Bible says they will, but it is only for a short space. The kingdoms of the world will soon pass, and the kingdom of God will reign forever. If you would like more understanding on these issues, I'm leaving a Bible study course under the link below. I've also linked the study on the Mark of the Beast as well as the video series Sunday Laws in the Pipeline and the series Out of the Cities. If you have any questions, please get to me at dbaron at gmx.com. Also, if you appreciate the work here, please like and share these videos. But furthermore, if you have been blessed and would like to contribute to keeping this ministry going, there is a PayPal link below the video. Thank you so much. Fear not, trust that your Father has told you these things before they come to pass. Pray and fast and follow the Word of God in whatever God would have you to do, remembering that only a few stood in ancient Babylon. But also realize that it is the love of your Father telling you before these things come to pass, so that you might take heed. That's what it says in 2 Peter 1.19. He is a good Father who loves you very much, so much that He gave His only begotten Son to save you. Blessings and God willing, we'll see you in the next video.